So if you've never been to our meeting before, uh, I do an interview, which is really just me asking some old guy a bunch of questions in this case. <laughs> you could be an old guy right now. Because those guys are smart. I don't know anything. Uh, Andy's been around a long time. I think I'll sit down. I don't know how this process is supposed to go. Right. Todd put all these bright lights on me, so I'm going to sweat through this entire interview. Uh, yeah, turn it on. Push up, all the way up. One more time. All the way up. Two clicks. Oh, there we go. It's like a two-click it. one. Sweet. There we go. So Andy likes teaching, but I sucked him into this. Yeah. This uh, is kind of different. I don't usually get to be the center of anything other than standing up with my PowerPoint <laughs> answering questions. So Andy's been around this business for a long time, and he's got a sordid past. So we'll talk about his sordid past and how he ended up in this business. This business is sort of made for um, uh, free thinkers. That's a good word, free thinkers. You have to appreciate freedom more than, than dependability of income. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good way to look at it. Um, so, so, everybody, Andy Teasley, please help me welcome him. Okay, so we're just going to start off with the, with the Christmas story. How did you get the name Andy the Christmas Guy? Oh, how did I get to be Andy? You're going to skip a bunch to go there. Oh, no, we, we can go back. Just that's the... Uh, that's like midway. Actually, carnival, carnival's like way before then. Yeah, the carnival was how, before what's that. What's before carnival? I owned a restaurant. I owned let's the chicken let's coop. Let's start with the chicken coop. Okay. I owned the last chicken coop in Southern California. That was actually a pail of chicken. We turned it into the chicken coop. Anybody from Riverside... Ever had some of the best chicken in the world up there in that dump on Chicago and University? That was my dump the last two years. Cost me $70,000 to lose there, and that was my MBA. Sweet. One day, one evening, I was out walking out, looking out the front window, and there's a, car, a bunch of carnival rides getting parked in the grocery store across the street. And they walked in and had dinner with us. I just skipped a step, though. Um, I started out in the snack bar business, and... Then we bought the restaurant, and we had two phone lines, which was kind of neat, because back then we didn't have cell phones or pagers or anything. So I stuck an ad in the yellow pages that said I had carnival supplies because I had snack bar stuff. And I figured that when the Catholic Church was going to have a carnival, we'd rent them a cotton candy machine. Well, after about, oh, five or six calls from people that wanted to rent game booths, my partner and I said, uh, we should be saying yes to these people. So we built 50 game booths. And we rented game booths to churches when they had carnivals. It was a neat business. But we saw the carnival guys pull, pull in, little raggedy old carnival. And I struck up a conversation. You know me, I like to talk, obviously. And uh, I told him, look, I've got churches that want rides, and they can't get rides. I bet you have a use for rental games. So we had a loose partnership. And I went out and booked spots for carnivals. Well, he got a wild hair one day and said, I'm going up north. And I said, we've got 12 events scheduled in the next three months. <laughs> what do you mean you're going up north? I'm sick of Southern California. I'm going to Northern California. And he left. Well, so I had 12 contracts and no carnival rides. <laughs> so I grabbed the Business to Business Yellow Pages, which is an, was a fantastic book back when they published it. And I called everyone that had carnival rides in there, and I said, hey, Anything you're not working on these weekends, send it out, and we'll split money. I'll take half, you take half. I'll give you the generator, the ticket, everything. You don't have to worry about anything. Just, and I don't care. Send me anything you got. So for the first couple of years, we had a pickup carnival. Uh, you know, like a pickup basketball game. You never know if, if uh, Walt Chamberlain's going to show up or whether it's <laughs> going to be all the local short kids, right? <laughs> so sometimes our carnival was, was uh, three bounces and, and a couple of kitty rides, and other times we had a spectacular carnival. You just never knew. And I started buying rides, and I got up. At the end, we had six adult big rides and six kid rides and worked 40 weeks a year and did all of Southern California. Sweet. Then I got in a bad car accident, and then I got married, and the wife said, if you want kids, you're getting out of that business. <laughs> Why? Why did you say that, Andy? Oh, it's it's a tough business to raise kids in. It's fun when you're young and single, and I, I won't share those stories publicly. <laughs> uh, so where did I meet my wife? She was my 
business partner's cousin. So that was not too exciting, but he set us up, and he's regretted it ever since. <laughs> uh, anyway, so we had a particularly bad season. I made the mistake of playing Glamis on Thanksgiving with drug the whole carnival down there and didn't sell a single ticket because they had their own rides. They didn't need ours. Yeah, that would be, what year was that? Oh. God, that must have been 94, 95. Yeah, that would, it was, was all families and no, everybody had sand cars. No oh, one was going to do that. Yeah. yeah. The whole crew got sick. There, there was sand and all the equipment anyway. And I was broke because it, it cost me a, a bunch of money. So I'm sitting in some fast food restaurant, and I saw a flyer for a guy that would come put lights on your house at, at Christmas time. So I went and said, hey, I've got a crew. I'll keep them sober and presentable. And they're crazy. They'll work 20 hours a day, and they'll climb anything, and I tell them to climb. So I took my carnival crew and went to work for this guy. And, oh. and somehow he figured out I could outsell most of his salesmen, so I started selling for him. And the last year I worked for him, I sold 80% of the jobs, and I installed 50% of the jobs in the residential stuff out in Palm Springs working Friday night, or Friday afternoon, Saturday, and Sunday with a couple of guys. And he made the mistake of ripping me off. He, every year he'd short me a little commission and we'd get square at the beginning of the year. And the last year I was there, I said, we're gonna fix this problem. You owe me 5,000 bucks from last year, and I'm gonna start collecting my commission all out of the deposit check, because I'd get a 50% check when I got the order, and I had a 20% commission. So I'm gonna start taking my 20% in the first check, not waiting for you to pay me on the second half. And you still owe me 5,000, I'm gonna take 25 until you, I get square. And he said, no, I don't owe you any money. And I said, no, that's not how it works. And he said, I don't owe you any money. I didn't make any money last year. He was an idiot. So I said, well, uh, I'm not going to tolerate that anymore. So I tell you what I'm going to do. I've got two contracts. I do, I do Main Street down here. I used to light all those trees. And I'll do, I'm going to keep Riverside Chamber of Commerce, the, the pole decorations we do down there, and those trees. And he said, no, screw you. I'm not putting you in business. Oh, and then I said, the other thing is I won't do any of your clients that, uh, that have ever worked with you for the next five years. You got five years to make them to forget about me. He said, no, nope, screw you, I'm not putting you in business. And I said, okay, third option is war and you don't want to go to war with me. <laughs> so he went to war with me and he just trotted down here and did everything he could to keep these two big accounts. It was his biggest two accounts. And it was miles from where he was. So I sent a postcard to everybody that I worked with and said, I don't work with them anymore. If you want to work with me, here's the phone number. So I ended up in the holiday decorating business. <laughs> I'm really good on business plans, can't you tell? It's a great business plan. Send a postcard, clearly. I, I took 60% of his clientele away. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, two years later, I bought his inventory for $10,000. So, so that was that's your first, it was your first don't want her deal? What's that? Was that one of your first, I guess you got lots of don't want her deals in between. You bought equipment and that business and oh, yeah. you bought lots of like don't want her business. It was always a don't want her. I wouldn't do, I mean the, the restaurant, the, a lady and her daughter had owned it for 30, 40 years and she lived in a motor home in the back and the daughter had a house and they, that was the only, they were the entire crew. Wow. Open to close seven days a week, except Sundays they, they went garage sailing. So they burn out, and then you bought, and then there was a series of essentially don't want her transactions from then forward. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You so know me. Give, give me an ugly carnival ride. I know how to paint them up and make them pretty. We keep talking about putting a Ferris wheel in downtown. I may bother you about that. Well, I, I sold my last <laughs> one. Hey, you're laughing back there, Tyler. I'm totally serious, man. Like, hey, who, I mean, who doesn't want to see a giant Ferris wheel at the end of Main Street? There you go. There's been one there before. It was, there was a... The gentleman that taught me the snack bar business ran Little Las Vegas in Fairmont Park. Little Las Vegas? Oh, yeah. It was snack bars and, and pinball machines and skee ball machines and all that stuff back in the 50s. Oh, well, it was like way back in the day. Way back. Way back. You, you're not old enough to remember. There used to be an amusement 
Park down there. No, I just assume Fairmont Park has always been the dumpy pile of crap that it is now. No, no, it used to be a really nice thing until uh, it was given over to other people. Apparently, it's been the uh, it was designed by the same designer as Central Park in New York, which is really weird that we have such a rundown park. If that's the case, well, design doesn't necessarily have to do with upkeep. Yeah, we need a budget. So okay, so Christmas business kind of started. You took over those contracts, and that kind of faded out when? What year? Oh, well, it was a good business, right? Yeah, I had mean, a long time. Yeah. It was, we were doing great. We were, we was hanging pole decorations in four states. Uh, we were hanging about 5,000 pole decorations every year at 100 bucks a piece. You can do the math. That was a pretty, pretty sweet little business. Seven boom trucks. Uh, always had five of them on the road for three months. Um, it was a great business. You work 18 hours a day, seven days a week for three months. And then you buy real estate the rest and of the year? Then nine or? months, you get to do other things. I took my first guru course with Ion Young Gray. Who? Ion Young Gray. She was an okay. attorney. Okay. Uh, she's disbarred now, and I heard she's out of jail. <laughs> <laughs> she must have had some pretty creative techniques. Oh, she, there were some good creative techniques. But this is how long ago this was, okay? One of the big things she told us to do was get you the old MLS books and call all the ads and find out who hadn't sold in an old MLS book. So, of course, we dumpster dove for three weeks trying to find MLS books behind real estate offices, but they didn't throw them out there. They need them for comps. I, they kept them for something. But uh, So that dates me a little on the guru course and and she was griping because they had gone to two pages on the car form and one page was all you needed so use the old car form xerox it and do all your handwritten stuff in blue ink so you could always tell the original okay so how long between that guru course and your first deal a long time i was one of the 97 percent oh were you yeah like hanging around meetings and stuff, or like what would you do? No, I just I just got busy with life and and owned a carnival then, and and so it was after I got out of the carnival business. Well, no, before that, yeah. So about 1990, I started buying dirt. You so you started with just dirt? Just dirt. Seller finance dirt or what? No, no. I I, I send out an offer. I, it's a great system. When it comes time to sell dirt, you're welcome to steal my system. I send a cover letter, a quit claim deed, and a return envelope. Send out 200 of those a week, and I usually got two or three a week back. And every time I got one back, I went, dang, people are gullible. <laughs> <laughs> they don't, they're, they're classic don't wanters, though, and you knew what to do with the dirt, though. Well, that's it. They are the ultimate don't wanter, and I'd offer them two or three or 500 bucks for a piece of property, and... And once I had it, I'd turn around and sell it for what it was worth. They didn't appreciate what it was. And, and that's why I'm not a licensed realtor. Because quite frankly, I think if you're licensed, you have an obligation to your seller to give them a good value. Fiduciary responsibility you have yeah. to disclose. Nice thing about not being a real estate agent, I don't have a fiduciary responsibility to those people. So when I offer them $500 for a $70,000 piece of property and they take it, that's an offer and acceptance from two individuals who make a decision that, that they choose to make. So how did, so from when you get that letter back and that random piece of dirt, how did you sell it? Oh, creatively, usually. I figured. Um, I, love, I love paper. If you guys, anybody knows me, I like paper. So we used to do what we called yellow dog, dog down real estate. And... The story to remember the yellow dog down is I took his big yellow dog as for a down payment. And when we closed escrow, I shot the dog. <laughs> oh, poor dog, right? What, that, what the moral of that story is, I really didn't care what I got for a down payment as long as I got somebody to sign my note and start sending me a check. It's just a commitment. Just a commitment. Um, so there's a nice baggie full of diamond rings that my wife keeps and occasionally things... Those of you know, it occasionally things get tight, and that baggie of diamond rings finds its way to the pawn shop for a few weeks. So, so it's like, essentially, you're saying I have this piece of dirt for fifty, seventy thousand, whatever, and you have terms for your note, and you say, "What do you got?" And they come up with stuff. Absolutely. And they just do you start probing them, like, "Hey, you got any like old jewelry?" Or what do you usually ask? Oh, I, I've done it the other way too. 
you, you go into the, the classifieds and you find some guy that's got a motorhome for sale. <laughs> and you say, I like your motorhome. My wife really wants a motorhome. Yeah, and, you know, it's great. You want, you want 5000 I don't have 5000 But I tell you what I've got. I've got this nice piece of land. I owe some money on it, but it's got good equity. You can check it out with a realtor. You can find out what it's worth. But I've got about, oh, $20,000 worth of equity in this, and, and you need to assume my mortgage. And I'm going to give you my equity in this lot, plus I'll give you $2,000 for your motorhome. And to them, they're thinking, wow, I'm getting $22,000 for my $5,000 motorhome. So you just gave them a note. I just got a note, and uh, they're paying some entity that, that services back to me. <laughs> so, and then I trade the motorhome for something interesting. Wait, so hold on. I didn't actually realize you created the paper on the property when you were selling it. I owe some money. You were actually creating the paper in another entity. Yeah. I, I just, it just, it's just, I'm... Laughing inside hysterically because of how that? ridiculous this is. You, you missed that part. Well, it, it's. F I don't think many people caught it, and I wanted to point it out because, you know, I think between Todd and I, we have like seven entities, and they all have a job, right? Well, yeah. And so they have to kind of all work together one way, and there's they a lot of smoke and mirrors in this business, and it's just funny that's the case. They don't all work together one way. They all work together. What's seven times seven? 49 ways? Yeah, exactly. You know. Um, heck, I don't know. Every house I own is an entity because yeah. they're all in a trust. Its own per particular trust. Nice property holding trusts. Those are great. Anybody that hasn't had a trust course should take one. You really should. It's worth yep. its weight in gold. Did you take wards? Or who's, no, whose trust class did you take? I took John's and I took somebody so long ago I've forgotten who the teacher was. Okay. So where do you still, do you still use like old trust paperwork layout or do you have like new stuff you put together oh i use the same old stuff it's it's, it, all, it's all you yeah, need yeah trust haven't changed much in like a hundred years it's the same stuff for like that entire duration except oh. for which file well there's no the nice thing about trust is there's no code law for it you know trust is all court law not code law Co title companies hate that yeah oh yeah title companies hate it but they get over it they do so anyway so i went into land and a typical land transaction, a, a good example. The guy, uh, a gentleman got on government grant three five-acre parcels of land just outside Indio in the late 50s. And he paid the taxes on those for years until about 1990 he passed away. His son inherited those three pieces of property, and you know what his son thought of that property? He said, that's that worthless desert land dad <laughs> bought. I'll be damned if I'm going to pay the taxes on it. So when he got my letter that promised him a check for $1,500 if he signed the, the quit claim deed, he was tickled pink because he was going to let it go anyhow. It's so free money. Yeah, it's free money to him. I got three five-acre parcels of land. I went to a broker who deal, dealt in remediation land, and unfortunately, he sold one of them for 70000 cash. Wait. So... Explain the remediation land thing, because a lot of people don't understand why people need remediation land. Oh, who here knows about a Stefan's kangaroo rat? Anybody ever seen one of those? Or Pearson's milk vetch? No, a milk vetch. That's yeah. a, they plant that if they want to mess with you. They're yeah. kind of fun that way. Yeah, Pearson's or the, uh, what's the toad? There's a toad, a desert tortoise. A fringe toad. Fringe, yeah, there you fringe go. toad toad. Oh, there's anyway. a couple, a couple of them. There's desert wash land. Anyway, there are all kinds of special land, and if you want to do a development, the way it works is you want to squish some, some Stefan's kangaroo rats. If you want to develop on five acres of land that appears that it might have some there, what you do is you donate 10 acres of the land that looks more likely or even less likely. I don't think the government really cares. Yeah. Uh, that's not, it's not ready to develop. It may never be developed because of where it is, but you donate that to the conservancy. Exactly. And f for doing that, they let you, you know, squish the kangaroo rats on the five acres you want to do it. So that's remediation land. So there are realtors who specialize in acquiring an, a certain quantity of land as remediation land for to replace land. So in other words, if you're a builder and you want to build a track and you go through your testing and essentially they say, like, well, there's all these animals and stuff. 
the state or the local local district wants you to replace that land in some way, and they don't really care where they get it. So if you got free land, a builder needs it today, they'll pay a hell of a lot more than a regular regular buyer will for that piece of dirt. Correct. And that's a, a remediation specialist. It's a great it's a great specialty if you want to work really hard and and suffer a lot as in that kind of realty. I cannot imagine having to do that as a job. It's got to be better than dragging people around to open houses, though. <laughs> that, hey, no one's going to talk to you about the paint color, right? That's true. That's true. So, so how long did you do land before you bought your first house from an old lady? Oh, well, land was great till 2007. I mean, I never really stopped that uh, excel until it just stopped. I mean, yeah. I I've still own 300 acres. I'm waiting for land to get exciting again and I'll sell it you off. Start trading. But uh, and then you know occasionally something would come along and, and I'd buy a house here and there and and use all that creative financing stuff I'd learned over the years. So you got what fifty? How many doors? Ta my peak was fifty one doors. What do you have now? Four. 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 You really got rid of them all, huh? All I got, on notes. I got rid of I got rid of three partners. Mm -hmm. And and I'm a really easy guy to be a partner with. If you decide that we're not performing happily enough for me, I'll tell you to divide it into two piles and I'll pick the pile. Or I'll, divi I'll divide it into two piles and you pick the pile. I think that's a fair way to split a partnership, quite frankly. Did you finance everything you sold? Carry notes on it or get cash? No, no, this is I, 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 I didn't sell. Mostly I, I got rid of partners. Oh, you just tr I cashed out. I cashed out one fourplex and paid off two other houses with it. Okay. So I'm down to four free and clear. Oh, nice. Which is kind of right. nice. I don't have any mortgages to pay. Sweet. So, and it was great. I mean, 9 and 10, they were selling us lots at a discount and throwing houses in for free. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, that was that was a fun time. I, I got such a kick out of people that wanted to be wholesalers in 9 and 10. <laughs> I would say, I, I have two parameters on the MLS. Uh, single family from, from 1,000 to 40,000 and... Uh, residential income from 1,000 to 125,000. If you put those searches in the MLS in nine and ten, you had a hundred some houses to look at. They're everywhere. Usually, you'd have to tweak your parameters a little bit because you'd get too many houses and it overflowed. So those were heady days, which is why I ended up with 51 doors. Yeah, they're giving away. Um, anyway, things have changed. Uh, we've all noticed you can't put those parameters in and have a hundred plus houses to choose from anymore, can you? So that's why I'm doing wobbly boxes. So yeah, so so now Lonnie deals. Yeah. So how many have you done since you decided you're going to give them a shot? About a dozen. So how any any really I mean there's there's we'll go over the particulars but any really interesting stories yet? Oh, aren't they all an interesting I mean, story? I mean yes. <laughs> I, I I the best one the, the best one I think is the one where I had just listened to a Jimmy Napier CD talking about waiting 11 seconds at when you get somebody answers a question. Who here hasn't heard that? Good, I thought that was the case. Ask somebody a question, listen to the answer, and then don't say anything for 11 seconds. See what happens. Do that experiment. It's amazing what happens when you shut up. So I had just bought a house a mobile home for two thousand dollars, and I got a lead on the next one. These this both came from people who were throwing their keys on the counter in the office. I went to the second one, and I had heard the CD, okay. so I hushed, and I let him sell me his house. And I said, "What do you want to do?" And he says, "Well, I just can't afford the space rent. I'm just going to give you the house." And I said, "Okay, I can do that. Do you have the pink slip?" He said, well, it's in, in Las Vegas. I can bring it back. I said, okay, that's fine. We'll do the deal. And then when it came time to, to negotiate, I, I, he handed me the pink slip. We'd agreed, shook hands. That was the deal. I mean, it's pretty simple. Um, but I st had decided I wanted to put that one in my Roth because I knew it was going to be a quick turn. So I said, by the way, uh, you're going to be getting a check for $100 from my Roth trustee because my Roth trustee doesn't understand free. <laughs> he, he didn't quite get that, but he was kind of happy to take the $100. So he got $100. I got his house. Um, 
we replaced the bathroom floor and sold it for $30,000. So can you explain what a Lonnie deal looks like? Because a lot of people, I'm sure, doesn't know what a don't know what a Lonnie deal is. Yeah, this is the thumbnail sketch. If you want the whole thing, I'm teaching for a whole two-hour segment on October, no, December 8th at Osiria. Lonnie Scruggs was a burnout landlord. He'd had his fill of the three T's, tenants, toilets, and turnover. He sold his entire rental inventory, and unfortunately, some people paid him cash. So he went looking for some small notes that he could buy that would perform to the numbers he wanted to make on his money. As he, was, he just wanted to play paper. I mean, I like paper. I yeah. understand that. Somehow along the line, somebody turned him on to mobile homes. And mobile homes are a great tool to generate paper because you can buy a mobile home for cash from someone that has a problem. Then you can turn around and sell that mobile home with financing for at least twice what you paid for it. Those of you that know how to run a financial calculator you can plug the numbers in and find out that your yield on that note runs between 47 and 62%. How many people are making 47% in their IRA today? And how, and how much money do you need to do a Lonnie deal? Oh, that's the best part. Uh, my 2015 $5,500 Roth contribution is currently up about $70,000, and it didn't get funded until the first of this year. So you turned a $5,500 Roth into $70,000? In less than a year. In less than a year. Right. If anybody doesn't understand that math, it's like next to impossible unless you do something unique like this. That's, And then in five years, it could be a half million dollar Roth? In 2020, it should be a half million dollars in the Roth, and I'm going to buy a mobile home park. And all of that is going to be tax-free? For the rest of my life. For the rest of your life. My wife's life and our daughter's life. So for like two to three thousand dollars, some nominal amount of money, plus some maybe some repair, you can buy a mobile home in a park in space in where there's space rent, rehab it or not, depending on the condition, list it as for sale for twenty, thirty, whatever thousand dollars at a reasonable payment. No, 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 no. no. Go on, tell me. We, we me list it as being X numbers, three thousand dollars down and three fifty a month. I like it. If somebody if somebody wants to know how much it is, I always say, well, the cash price, but you don't have to pay cash, is you know twenty five thousand mm -hmm. dollars. But it's really just three thousand down and three fifty. I'd rather you take over my note. I mean, I took the time to find somebody to lend me the money. I'd like you to just take it. They want they like the income. They don't really want all that cash. And uh, it's a lot easier to find people with $3,000 in their pocket than it is to find people with $25,000 in their pocket. So. Okay, so I'm going to, I've, I've heard from several people on these, because I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm extremely curious about these deals. I'm like really excited. I've, I, have, I have some family with some money sitting around, and they're kind of like, what do I do with it? And I'm like, just buy a mobile home and then sell our finance. And they're like, how can I do that? I'm like, look, you can get like $500 a month in cash flow per, per property. It's easy money. And they're that way. They're west. And I didn't really know how to explain it, but I said, hey, pick up this book. So the one objection that I've noticed that everybody has seemed to have on these things is how do you get the buyer to qualify for the park? I don't. They qualify for the park. That's if you walk into one of my open houses, eat the cookies that my daughter bakes, and uh, say, I love this house, I want to buy it, you get handed an application for the park. And for step one, don't make me an offer until they say you can live here. And the park does a great job of screening all of my applicants for me, and I don't have to do any of that garbage. So a lot of people will get really weird feedback when they call parks as an investor until you try and explain to these park people exactly what it is you're doing. Do you have any pushback from the parks at all on these type of transactions? No. Because they love you? There are, there are some parks where you have a pushback, and you know what, what I tell you is you just go to the next park because they're everywhere. But most parks, when you say, I want to buy the two worst trailers you have in your inventory for cash today, 
and I'm going to sell them to someone you approve, and I'm going to finance it for the buyer. When they hear you willing to finance old trailers for people, you're their best friend because trying to find financing at a bank for something pre-76 is impossible. Uh, yeah, anything July 1976? Yeah, somewhere yeah. in there. Yeah, there's no lender financing at all. Well, you, there's like two lenders in the country. Well, well and a buttload of us private party Lonnie dealers. And, and Andy. Um, and, and the thing is that you don't have to be really proficient at fixing things. Lonnie never did anything to a mobile home. In his book, he talks about if there's a soft spot in the floor, you just unhook the carpet from the, the, the tax strip, fold it back, patch the, f the hole in the floor, and then stretch the carpet back onto the tax strip. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't do anything. I like polishing stuff up, so unless it's like the one I got for 100 bucks that was just beautiful, uh, we generally paint them white and put in wood floors and fix the kitchens up and all that stuff because I can do all that for three or four or $5,000, and it makes them a lot easier to sell. So you get most of your money back in that deal? Oh, yeah. With the down payment and everything? Well, sometimes. I, I cash out a certain amount of my... Yeah. I mean, I've got investors in the room who, who I've borrowed money from because that solves the Dodd-Frank dilemma by me going out and borrowing the money up front and then selling subject to. Okay. Dodd-Frank says that as an individual, you can owner finance to an owner-occupant one whole house a year. If you're an entity, you can owner finance to an owner-occupant three whole times a year. Neither one of those work for me. So what I typically am doing is I'm selling a house subject to a mortgage that I signed. Now, sometimes I sign that mortgage with an entity of my own. Sometimes I sign that mortgage with an investor who would like to make 9% on their money. So either one of those transactions, I am they're assuming a mortgage that I signed for. So nobody ever lent any money to the owner-occupant. That's a pretty... It seems complicated until you sit down with a piece of paper and we'll go over it 16 times and it'll finally sink in. The, the trick is to don't ever lend money to an owner-occupant. So, but I can borrow all the money from an investor I want because I'm never going to live in that box. They made the loan to an investor on the premise that it was to an investor and then the, the new buyer is taking over your existing investor financing. Right, so nobody ever lent any money to an owner-occupant. Right. The initial loan isn't made to an to owner occupant. Whole new set of disclosures. Yeah, or you could use a licensed home mortgage originator, and they turn my little four-page document into a small phone book. I still can't find one that'll work with me. Still working on that. I I tried a long time, and then then Pete gave me the solution. I slapped yeah. my head and went, "Gee, why didn't I think of that?" Yeah, I'm. I'm that's that's all. Everything I've come up with now is essentially alternatives to using an originator because it's just not going to happen. I mean, who here is, is sat down and, I, I mean, my last house I bought for myself was 2000. So uh, that was back then, I mean, it was that much paper. And you're supposed to read it all before you sign it, right? And initial the bottom all the pages? Who the heck does that? That's scary stuff. Somebody wanted to know the contract I use when I negotiate to buy a house. You know what my favorite contract is to buy a house? Notepad. A notepad. I will sit down, when I'm buying a house from somebody, I will sit down, we'll take them out to lunch. I, we'll go, I'll talk for 90 minutes about nothing and steer the conversation to make them a little scared of having a pile of cash on their kitchen table and, and show them the benefits of having an income stream. We'll, we'll negotiate a deal, I will shake their hand and I always say the same thing. I say, we have a contract, it's binding between you, I, and God, and nobody has a right to break it. And then I'll take a slight pause and I'll say, however, two people rarely remember a conversation exactly the same way. At which point I will take my notebook out and I will take a pen and I will say, do you mind just jot down what we've agreed to here on this piece of paper? And, and that way we know, we'll know exactly what that we agreed to. And, and you know, that way we don't have to worry about remembering different. Now, anytime you're buying a house from someone and you hand them a car form, 
That's a scary piece of 16 pages of paper, isn't it? That's a lot of boxes to fill in. Absolutely. And if I write a contract and stick it under their nose and it's one page, even if I write it in my chicken scratch, they, they're thinking, hey, maybe he snuck something in here on me, right? If the seller writes the contract, what are the odds that I snuck something in on them? Yeah, zero. Zero, right? So they write it. I make some lame excuse about writing bad, not that that's a lie. It's certainly the truth. And uh, we both sign it at the bottom. I generally try to make a little change, and we both initial a little change. Sometimes they write it down just right, and we don't make any changes, but occasionally, you know, I like to throw a little change in so they know I read it. <laughs> then, then this is, see, the modern technology, right? I say, do you have a smartphone? And everybody does now. And I say, well, take a picture. That way you have a copy. It used to be I had to go talk to the restaurant manager to get him run through the fax machine, and you get that curly yeah. Q paper. Yeah. So, but nowadays they take a picture. So they have a copy of the contract. I have the original. I take it and open escrow the next day. That's the best real estate purchase contract ever created. It's the easiest. Absolutely. It's not scary. It can cover everything you need to cover. I'm not a big, mean, evil man. And if they say, you know, I've changed my mind. I really don't, I, I didn't understand what I was doing. I, I don't want to do it. If I can't renegotiate that at that point, I'm not going to force them to sell me their house. So what does escrow do if you forget something that belongs in that contract? Well, escrow always writes the contract anyhow. They, they take my one-page agreement and turn it into 16 pages of escrow instructions. So you really don't have to worry if you miss some legal jargon because escrow is going to create it anyway. What's legal jargon? Well, I don't put that in a contract. It's the six pages attached attached to your escrow agreement. Yeah, yeah. But that's the purchase contracts, one piece of paper. And there's old English law that says that the, if there's anything ambiguous in a contract, that the court will hold against the party that drafted the contract. So if there's something ambiguous in that contract, and I think it reads one thing and they think it reads the other way, and we did end up in court for some reason, if the judge agrees that it's ambiguous, then I should prevail because they drafted the contract. So the whole system is essentially set up to ensure that they understand the contract and they drafted it. So if there's anything that they misdraft, that it's in favor of you. Right. Right, if they thought what they wrote down meant one thing and I thought it meant another. But usually when you do your contracts in plain English, that doesn't happen very often. Well, no, it's, it's two regular people aren't writing two, where, four, yada, 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 no. and some yeah, lawyers We don't speak. get paid by the pound like the attorneys. Yeah. Well, at $500 an hour, they can come up with 86 pages. I mean, that's how long our loan docs used to be. Oh, yeah. I think they get paid by the pound, though, not by the hour. Oh, man. I'll tell you what. When we get the bill, it's by the hour. <laughs> <laughs> so we've done about a dozen of these Lonnie deals. Um, done a bunch of seller financing. Done a bunch of land financing. All of them are about the same thing. So it's essentially just two people agreeing to some sort of terms, usually a don't want her. And when you go to resell, it's a somebody who really wants it, the thing you're selling. And so they'll pay it a premium. So really all you're doing is buying something at a discount because somebody doesn't want it and reselling it to somebody who really wants it and you give them terms to make it more favorable. Right. That's one of the reasons they want it. Because they have terms. Because they have terms. So we did an experiment in the office. Matt will, Matt, Matt will probably can, can fill people in. We got, uh, and I was talking to Lisa about it too, some of these people have been coming to us with these flip projects and I said, w what's the seller want? And they're all these regular sellers that will, will they take financing? Lisa, how, did every, uh, how many people said they take, everyone said they take, sell, they, they prefer seller financing. They want to sell with seller financing. Matt, how many buyers on the phone wanted to put that, buy that property with one single Craigslist ad? Like the phone rang because we just put a single Craigslist ad that said like 1950 a month, 60,000 down, seller financing. The phone rang off the hook. Oh yeah. And the price was 110% of market value, but it doesn't have a list, list price. They just want, w they'll put 50% down. They don't care. Well, that's it. That's it. People are, are scared of going to a bank. 
they, they invest a lot of their time and effort and have to open their soul in front of the, in front of the bank officer just to get told, no, you don't qualify. Yeah, nobody likes that. Nobody likes that. I mean, it's not where it was in 2000 when I did my last bank loan where they hold a glass plate under my nose and, wow, he fogged it. Okay, you can have the money. <laughs> it was, it was kind of nice, actually. Yeah, those were the days. You want an 80-20? You want 125% of value? Sign here. Yep. Write yep. your check. And then they wondered why they all came crashing down. What a surprise. So if somebody wanted to get started on a Lonnie deal or some kind of seller finance deal, what should they do first? Well, you could come take one of my classes, or you could come out and buy me lunch. And I'm, I figured out something I can eat at Red Robin again, so I'm back Sweet. there. <laughs> so I know there's a lot of you that have bought me lunch at Red Robin. So is it a good value? There we go. Thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoy teaching because I couldn't do what I'd do if I hadn't sat across a dinner table from old gray-haired guys. And I encourage... Anytime you have an opportunity to, to sit across the table from somebody who's been banging their head against this particular wall, mm -hmm. uh, do it. Do it. Uh, we all owe the guys that taught us. And you can't read, you can't learn this stuff in a book. No. Um, you, you can try. You can try. There's some good Jimmy Napier CDs out there. I, I, <coughs> I found that, I mean, I think me and Todd combined have read probably 100 plus real estate books. And uh, and every single time it's entirely different when we go to do the transaction, that the process just doesn't quite go the way it seems to. It seems to go so smoothly when it's in writing. It goes very differently in practice. Yeah, it's, a, it's easy to polish them up when they're in the book. Yeah, they can make it look like it. They, they skip a few steps. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I, I, I think I've trained quite a few people how to negotiate and, and I just good old boy. I'm quite frankly, I, I you know, I, I don't know anything. I'm just a little old fat man here. I do my little thing. I'm sorry, ma'am. Did I leave my boots under your bed? What's that? I'm sorry, ma'am. Did I leave my boots under your bed? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now you've got this. Uh, have you taught other than in in other lunches? Have you taught publicly before now? Oh yeah. Yeah, I, I teach every time any one of these clubs will invite me to come out. I've got a great course on Lonnie deals that I generally will, two rules for me to teach something, okay? Rule number one is I have to have done it and it had to work. I'm not going to teach you to do something I read in a book somewhere and I haven't tried. That rule number two, it has to make sense in our current economy. I mean, if you really want me to, to do private tutoring and teach you how to buy land, I'll do it. But it's not the time to invest 200 postage stamps in doing land. Because quite frankly, there's no big excitement. You're not going to sell it quick. You're going to end up like I have 300 acres. I could sell wholesale or I sit on it and wait. Some of it gets taller, some of it gets shorter. So right now I'm teaching Lonnie deals. And I've got that, uh, it's about a 90 minute, two hour class. Um, I think it's very informative. How many people there have been through one of my classes at uh, RIA Club? Yeah, did you learn something? Did you go try it? Lee went out and bought four houses. I mean, that's, that's what I love to hear. That's pretty awesome. That's the best thing you can do. Anytime you come to one of these things and, and hear an educator is if you apply it, tell them you did it because the 97% the percenters are really frustrating to those of us that work as educators. Work being a relative term, I never get paid for it. But I do owe a debt to the people that train me, and I try to pay it forward. I, that's a very real debt. We, we, you know, I think even now with the club, like running this club, 50% uh, of our time is spent buying property, and 50% of it is essentially fielding emails or phone calls or whatever from people. And uh, I don't really feel like I could take any less of it. Like, I, I, somebody sat down and spent the time to train me. Like, I feel like I have to give it back in some way. Well, if you're an honorable person, you do. I mean, you could be miserly and end up dying sad and have nobody come to the funeral. <laughs> <laughs> or you can be generous with your time and your knowledge and, and educate people. So on that note, do we want to walk around with a microphone? Anybody got any questions for Andy? I have a question. I think we that's, that's flipping a mobile home. That's buying a mobile home, doubling the price, and, and carrying the paper. 
It's called the Lonnie Deal because Lonnie Scruggs wrote the book on it, and he taught seminars on this before he passed away. Jeff. Um, I would like to take your words to your number. Uh, this is, oh, my number? Come get a card or get one of those flyers. I have, I have an, a rule about lunches. People are really enthused in this room. The first test is you have to stay enthused long enough to make a telephone call tomorrow or the next day and, and call me then because I made the mistake when I first made this offer of scheduling a bunch of lunches at a meeting and about half the people forgot. That's really frustrating because uh, if I'm doing lunch, it means I have to specifically take that time away from my job site, go get to the restaurant to be there and meet you and schedule to be out off the job site for at least two hours. Some, sometimes we look at the clock and it's six o'clock and I went, where the heck did the day go? Because there was enough good questions. But that's the rule, call me. My flyers are on the chair. Here's cards here. But come see me after. I'll be in the bar, too. If they're leaving, then they, they it's worth not worth them sticking around, I guess. Yeah. If I'm too boring to, to listen to tonight, you got to wonder if you really want to sit around with me at lunch. No, I'm lazier than that. I'm going to buy a mobile home park from somebody who's 80 and tired of running it. Well, I have I have a date parameter and I have a, a dollar amount parameter. So depending on what I'm able to find in 2020, it may be a down payment on a nice big park or it may be a cash purchase of a smaller ratty park. But either way, I want to have some potential to expand. I want to be doing my own lottie deals in my own park. Uh -oh. Well, Dean, um, first of all, I want to to uh, see you. Uh, you were very, very great to take your time. And uh, I did a uh, deal uh, uh, where I brought the fun drop there. Had to bring out the fun drop down. Thank you so very much, Pedro. It's a uh, house on school bus and I'm uh, now out in, uh, in Anaheim. But Okay, first question, who here thinks this is a real estate business? Oh, good. What kind of business is this? People. It's a people business. And I want that mobile home park manager to appreciate that Andy takes the two nastiest trailers he has in his inventory, makes them some of the nicest trailers in the, in the park, gets him a qualified tenant who comes in and, and makes a space rent. By doing that, I'm their pal. And the reality in mobile home parks is kids inherit them. They don't want to pay space rent. Life changes. One spouse retires and the other doesn't, and it's the vacation home. And they just they don't care. They're dropping their keys on the counter. They want to go away. And that means a, s a lack of a space rent to a park manager. Because they know that I'm one of those tools in their toolbox, instead of taking those keys or, or telling them, no, you've got to try to sell this for 60 days before you can walk away, they just say, here, call this guy. So I built that relationship with the park manager, and that's how you get free trailers. Okay. My typical thing when I go out to a park is I walk the entire park. Uh, I, I have that habit. When I was buying houses, I'd walk the entire farm. And generally, at some point in strolling through a park, you will run into at least one or two Mrs. Kravitzes. And Mrs. Kravitz knows everything that's going on in that park. And 
she knows that that one across the street with the tinfoil in the windows, that lady died six months ago and her kids are, you know, in Timbuktu. And she's probably got their phone number and, and she's happy to give it to you and then you're in a good position to negotiate for that house. Plus, I, you know, I walk the park. I like to be the one that sets the bottom price in a park. So if uh, the park I'm in right now, anytime somebody drops that sale price down below $10,000, I'm going to swoop in and buy it. Of course, I can't buy any right now, but that's a whole separate story. So let's get this clear. I, I'm lazy. That's what escrow is for. And, and the buyer or seller pays for half escrow anyhow. So they record it. it it's like a vehicle. You've got the, the lender is going to be the lien holder on the, on the title to the house. So it's very secure. And I have a nice four-page security agreement and, and uh, loan a note. You know, it's something I stole from the state. If you shoot me an email, I happily share it with people and a one-page assumption agreement, and that's all I use, and my, my escrow people appreciate the paperwork I provide, but they take care of dotting the T's and crossing the I's. So, uh, I got the simplest question. Uh, what do you guys write? Holy cow, that's a jargon flag I haven't had called in a long time. A note is a, a contract. It's an agreement between two people. Uh, two parties, one provided something and the other one has agreed to pay a certain amount for a certain term. And it's, it's, it's a loan, it's a note. It's, it's a mortgage, well a mortgage is like a trust deed. A, a note is the agreement, it's, it's you know, an IOU with, with a little more structure to it. Uh, you know, I bought, I'm buying your mobile home I'm putting my mobile home up as security against this note and I, I agree to pay you you know, three three thousand dollars down and three fifty a month at nine percent for the next eighty five months. Any other questions? Okay. Hi, Andy. This is Dean with a couple of questions for you. All right. Uh, Well, there's a funny thing about laws that get written in Congress and, and they make it through the Senate and, and the president signs them. It's usually this great amorphous idea and then it depends on a bunch of bureaucrats to write the regulations. Um, as far as I know, those regulations haven't finished being written and nobody's gone to court yet. So the answer is I don't know. You know, theoretically, you should be able to do three entities in three notes each and have nine done that way. However, comma, I'm not an attorney, I'm not a CPA, I'm just a little old fat man that does his thing. And, and I would much rather not lend money to homeowners. So what you, you said, uh, I've asked you this question before, something similar, and you said, does it pass the, the smile test in court? Which, what, would you say in court, can you... Oh, can, can you do a deposition without giggling? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's important, right? You've got to be able to sit in that office with the big oak desk, and when he asks you, are these three entities really just you? Is it just your alter ego? And can you say no and not smile? And quite frankly, I do not like walking through that little gate, the wooden one there, where there's a man in a black dress. Uh, you, who here remembers Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome with the, the spin the wheel, right? I mean, that's what happens once you walk in that little gate. You're spinning that wheel. So I, I try to avoid that. Usury? You're trying to make me remember what those four initials are? No. Okay, good, because I have, uh, thankfully I have it on my slide. Well, 
Dodd-Frank says that the maximum amount you can charge is 6.75% above that for the, annual, the average funds offer rate. No, average prime offer rate. See, I'm, I'll get close. Anyway, ask me for the slide. I'll get the initials right. Anyway, it's a chart. The government puts it out. When I started doing this, the lowest interest rate on the shortest term was 2.75%. So I added 6.75 and 2.75 and got 9.5 and figured 9 is a safe number. Right, right. That 6.75 is a magic number. Uh, plus, in California, my understanding is 10% and higher is usury unless you're a licensed They'll they'll cram you down. You could write a note for fifteen percent, but they'd cram you down in court anyway. They, and they, they may do it even less favorable. So if you wrote a fifteen percent note, they may make it a five percent note because they don't like you. If you don't break that ten percent barrier, they probably won't. But we're not attorneys. That's just what I hear. I'm just a coward. I don't like the man in the black dress. Any more questions? Oh, of course, it's all the way across there, plus one in the front. We should like put like a little thing on him, seeing like like a little orange cone and see him walking around. How do I get paid? Yeah. Well, if I have ten thousand dollars in a manufactured home, that's acquisition and rehab. Then I go and borrow $22,000, and they hand me a check for $22,000. Then I pretty much got paid. So it's like, it's like selling the lawn deal twice, essentially. You're selling it to You're it. selling it before you sell it. You're yeah, getting yeah. paid before you sell you're it. You're selling it to an investor and then to your buyer. Yeah. I, I, I want somebody to make that mortgage payment for me. That's my goal, because I may make a couple of those payments myself. Me, I'm not on the beef and pork yet, and no starches. So, sure, yeah. I just eat a lot of grilled chicken these days, <laughs> and salad. Anybody left? One more. There we go. Say that again. Oh, okay. All right. Well, you can be an individual, or you could be, you know, the uh, the Green Frog LLC, and, and the Green Frog LLC can do three, and an individual, you know, George Smith can do one. So an entity is is a separate. Business and of course entities in California each cost eight hundred dollars a year to, to maintain, and I've heard it postulated that trusts might be count as an entity, but I sure wouldn't want to try that. It's GP general partnership that's Ward's new thing. Yeah, you could do a limited partnership or a general partnership, and and then an LLC or a corporation, but that's I think you need a sophisticated entity to do that. And yeah, you do. You need three I don't think trusts are really that sophisticated. No. Uh, okay, so are there any other questions? Okay. Hi, Marie. Then you reach the subject that I don't want to, that I don't teach because I've never built a house. I, I'm a little nervous about building houses, quite frankly. I think the cost of getting your first stick out of the ground in California makes it really prohibitive to build what's going to sell in our current market. So there are people do it. I mean, I don't know. We have any have any builders in the room? No, we got a couple. Okay. So, so what's it cost to get the first stick out of the ground? Uh, 
Oh yeah, that's no. I'm not talking about rehabbing. That, that, trust me, if I can keep one wall up and make it a remodel, I'll do that. Where's but where's, Mar where's Maria at? But oh, you're right there. There's Maria. What's the cost? Wait, you you have the spreadsheet. What's the cost on the stuff we're looking at right now for infill? To, to before we put a stick in the ground. Do you remember? What's the like before Permits, we start construction? All that other junk. All that other stuff on the top of that giant spreadsheet. Yeah. That's what I think. Oh my God, a lot. That's a good answer. So she sends a spreadsheet over, and like it's just like line, 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 and they're all just miscellaneous fees all the way down. And I think there's some. It's where I think we're approaching. It was like forty thousand dollars. Approaching forty thousand dollars. Yeah. So from three forty four to seven dollars square foot, just school fees. Yeah. See, that's that's why. It, does, do you understand why I'm not a developer? I I just I'd rather buy a piece of garbage. And I tell you what, I had a house in Blythe. The, the house in Blythe was a, a giant termite shell. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't make any loud noises in the house because if you did, it would probably fall down on your head. They were holding hands to hold it up. In that house, though, they had replaced the bathroom, and the uh, most of the house was built in standard Blythe form. They put cinder blocks on the ground, and then they ran stringers across the cinder blocks, and then they put the floor down on top of the stringers. That's how they built houses. But they put in a nice bathroom with a cement floor. So I actually had the plans drawn up to remodel the house around the bathroom. And we would have remodeled the house around the bathroom and eventually would have turned into just the slab of the bathroom and one wall that had to stay up, but I would sneak new boards into it and kill the termites. So that's a whole different proposition than building a new house. There's a lot of government, can I say caca? <laughs> say whatever you want. So I worked for a builder for several years uh, and most builders We're okay. We're talking about complying with the Dodd Frank law, selling with owner financing to an owner occupant. Thank you. So, if you want to learn that exact question that Jim asked and some other ones, you should go see Andy's full two hours in Orange County uh, with Car at Carin's meeting at OC Ria on December eighth at six thirty at the Avenue of Arts. Hotel in Costa Mesa. It's uh, December, yeah, December eighth, Thursday, December eighth. So it's coming up in like two weeks. Yeah, yeah, and that's the last one scheduled. Although I will be teaching an in-depth class in May, so you get a whole four hours with charts and a book and everything. So sweet. Yeah. We done? We good? Any other questions? One more. more? Belt it out, John. Just yell. Per year. Every three, yeah, you get three You can just do three a, three a year. But like I said, I'm much happier not lending money to owner-occupants. Me either. I don't want to do it either. So. Generally speaking, it, it applies to, if you're looking at business practice. Yes. Of, of doing seller financing. What, once you're operating as a business in it, as a, a business doing the thing, they treat you entirely different in court. Okay, you belt it out, I'll answer it. Well, go to Meetup and, and look up OC Ria. It's That's at the Avenue of Arts Hotel, but if you go if you type O C R E I A into Meetup, it'll pull it right up. And, and you can confirm they may actually move us into a bigger room. Yeah, this is a nice crowd. Thank you all for coming to listen to me.